Okay, uh, thanks to Ian. Those technical problems have been sorted out, we think, we hope. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next uh, speaker. Uh, John Sebel is an archaeologist, cultural anthropologist, actor, and author. Um, as an archaeologist, he has documented and recorded He's documented and recorded a lot of stuff, I should suspect, so let's see what those things are. Uh, manifestations of past soundscapes, soundscapes and haunted ruins, um, which I believe is something he's going to be talking to us about today. As an actor, he has appeared in many movies, TV series, and educational TV programming, including the sci-fi classic Dune, as well as the A&E TV series, Paranormal State. And James Bond. And James Bond. <laughs> Gotta get that one in there. Um, John will be talking today about auditory manifestations, so I will hand over to John now. I will tell Mike because I tend to move around a lot. Okay, and now for something completely different. Seriously. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, uh, my work on American Civil War battlefields. And uh, I'm going to try to get as much in as possible in my methodology and theory today, so I'm going to be reading a lot, which I normally don't do. I'm very, very active and I'm very, very spontaneous, but I want to get in as much as I can, so excuse me for reading. I'm glad, I'm it's great to be back here in England. It's about my our fifth time in the last 12 months for conferences, so we always enjoy coming here. Um, England is kind of like a second home to me. My first archaeological work was in Winchester way back in 1969. So you can date me. I was only in high school then, though, remember that. So during the day, I was working in Woolsey Palace. And at night, I was a, well, a ghost hunter, what you call them. So I've been working in the field of archaeology, anthropology, and ghost hunting since 1969. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my, uh, my experience. But first things first. Next slide, Mary. Wakes everybody up. Okay, is everybody awake right now? It's kind of late, it's a Sunday, so. But this is very, very important because this is some of the auditory cues, sound mark cues that I use in my investigations trying to resonate with uh, what remains on Civil War battlefields. During the Civil War, there were 57 different bugle calls, and each one had a different significance. So that particular one meant order to assemble, to get ready for what's coming, what's coming next. So I, I decided to use that for that. Uh, OK, Mary, next slide. And let's see what we've got here. OK, so now. We begin again this history of us. That includes you, and you, you, Mary, me, and them. This is us during the day at Burnside Bridge on the Antietam Battlefield. The Antietam Battle uh, during the American Civil War, September 17, 1862, was the most horrendous, deadliest battle in American uh, American history. 24,000 casualties in six hours. Very, very extremely violent, extremely deadly. Here at Burnside Bridge, it's been called the Thermopylae of the American Civil War. Here, in, at this place, at this bridge, there were 287 Confederate soldiers defending the bridge against 12,500 Union troops. It took the Union troops five hours and five assaults to get across that bridge. And the only way they got across was the Confederates ran out of ammunition. So they retreated back. So this is an extremely important battle, very, very deadly, and not investigated that much by ghost hunters, who I don't really uh, like to call. I am not a ghost hunter, by the way. So it's an extremely important place. This is us walking, the initial, what we usually do is an initial soundscape to get a feel of what's there, to record the sounds of what's there. Because on a battlefield, the most important sense is hearing. You couldn't see the landscape. So sound was very, very important, and that's what we use as cues in our investigations. Uh, so here we are crossing the bridge. 
Six hours later, around 12 o'clock at night, I was crossing the bridge with my storyboard. I created a storyboard for different scenarios that would resonate with what occurred in particular spaces on the battlefield. So here I am, you're going to hear what happens. Here I am with my little storyboard setting up the next scene to the investigators on the other side of the bridge. And this is what we're recording. Is that you, Captain? That's unaltered video directly live recording of somebody who asked me, Captain, is that you, Captain? Now, is that significant? Prior to that audio, I had just done a roll call of the 11th Connecticut. So somebody asked me after that roll call, Captain, is that you, Captain? To me, that's very contextual. That's the kind of stuff we get. We get a lot of it by what I do. I just wanted to give you that little teaser there at the beginning. Sound, did you hear it all? Did it sound like that? Captain, is that you, Captain? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's clear. Unadjusted, unaltered, exactly as it was recorded. And what we do, we record on what we call RTEDPs. Do you know what that, you know what that is? It's a real-time EVP audio recorder set to a six-second delay. So we have investigators with the headphones on with a six-second delay. And when I say something, six seconds later, you hear what I say. And six seconds after that, you hear any response. So if there is a response, what do we do? We immediately follow it up. Because if somebody is communicating to us, we respond. We don't record walking around and say stupid things like, is anybody here with us tonight? And then the next day, we analyze that was eight hours of tape. They don't hear that. My God, you got something. Well, then it's too late. You just missed your opportunity. We got it six seconds later and we respond. Every time we go back, and we go back many, many times to this bridge <coughs> to reiterate what we just did, what we just found, we get more and more responses. Why? Because of this. Okay, next slide. Now, Henry Glassy said in archaeology and folklore, the past is too important to leave to historians. The human reality is too important to leave to novels. I say what remains of past productions of space is too important to leave to ghost hunters. So we need archaeologists to do these kind of things. So that's what I do. Uh, now, for me, this is very important. Haunted locations are fragmented representations of past productions of human cultural space. They are not demons out there. They are not little people out there. They're past productions of human cultural behavior. So as the archaeologist, the first thing I do and what I ask is, this happened here. What remains? That's a good question. Very simple idea. This happened here. What remains after the event here? That's what I try to analyze. Okay, so, next slide. That is actual, a, a lithograph of what happened here. No space ever vanishes utterly, leaving no trace. So, when you saw that first slide of us walking across the bridge to do that initial parapathetic walk, to get a feel of the ambience of the area, to record the sounds, one of us took this photograph. Does anybody see anything in that photograph? What do you see here? Looks like a, sh a shadow soldier. Looks like a. It's kind of obscure. It kind of. Uh, we took another photograph right after we caught this. There was nothing there right after. Over here, it looks like somebody lying there, a face with his mouth open and he has a mustache. Do you see that? It's 
kind of kind of uh, distorted and obscure, but on a regular photograph, it's a lot more obvious. Two things right behind where the investigator is walking by. Now, it, are these two figures? Are they real? Are they real? Uh, shadow person, a residual of somebody who was in pain, who died there. Well, first of all, that is very contextual. Right where that lady is, is where the first assault toward the bridge occurred. It's where 39 soldiers of the 11th Connecticut died. And hundreds were wounded. So it's very, very contextual. But the question is, if I can see this, read this. The important question is, how do we document what's left? I begin not, I begin not end with the following. Next one, there. To establish one's explanations, one must predict things about the archaeological record based on already accepted facts, and then find that these predictions are themselves fulfilled on examination of the record. The archaeological record says that on September 17, 1862, at that location, the 11th Connecticut assaulted the bridge. In that assault, 39 members of the 11th Connecticut died. In that photograph, we might have evidence of some of those who died. Might. We are doing further tests to see if we get something else there. So again, we do something. We, this is just an irregular uh, walk without doing any scenarios. That's what we picked up. So now I know I can establish a baseline saying, next time I go back there, we have this photographic anomaly, possibly. Let's go and test some scenarios and find out if this is a residual recording, see if we get it again, or is it interactive? Does it interact with us? So those are the kind of things we do. Next, man. If I'm going too fast, let me know. I have a lot of things to say. But anomalous experiences, whatever their nature, are intrinsically implicated in precisely the social processes and contexts which cannot be reproduced in laboratory conditions. We cannot predict whether ghosts exist or a haunting exists being in a laboratory under controlled conditions with white laboratory coats on. We have to be out in the field testing hypotheses, saying, this happened here, what's left? If we did this, which is contextual to what happened in that space, then this should happen. If it doesn't, we throw it out and test another hypothesis. That's what we do in the field. That's my storyboard. I have a storyboard of all these 20 scenarios. If I did this in this particular space, then this should happen. Whether you believe it or not, 90% of the time, we get something. And what we get on a Civil War battlefield is acoustomological in nature, a particular way of being auditory, which is contextual because that's what happened on a battlefield. You depended on sound, not sight. That was the major sensorium. So here we have us setting up a scenario which we're going to talk about later. Mary is there reading a letter from an officer of the 11th Connecticut at the 11th Connecticut Monument who survived the battle because he was a surgeon. So he is writing a letter home to his wife describing the battle. She's reading the letter, and later you're going to hear what happened. Then, here we are. We have Mary and another investigator dressed in black. They are nurses. Yes, nurses dressed in black, not white. Why? They didn't want to show the blood. So they dressed in black. They're there with a Confederate flag searching for wounded. I don't know if you can see it. Over there you see a light. That is not a torch. A torch was not contextual to the Civil War. So we used a lantern, which was contextual. Very, very important. We don't go around dressed up with logos that say Ghost of the Civil War on it, because that immediately identifies you as an outsider. I want to be identified as 
one of them a band of brothers. Okay, so that's very, very important. Here, you will hear what happened when we did this. <laughs> On, during that battle, when I said the Confederates retreated, one Confederate soldier did not, Lieutenant Colonel William Holmes, 2nd Georgia. He was told to hold the bridge at all costs. So when his men retreated, he advanced because he said, I will hold the bridge or die in the ditch. He died in the ditch. Five soldiers of the 51st New York came across that bridge on the final assault. I know every one of their names, and I accused them at the bridge. Every one of their names. They came across that bridge, stripped that lieutenant colonel of his clothes because he had gold-pleated uh, emblems on. He had brand new shoes, which are very important. Stripped him of his clothes, played gamble for his shoes, dragged him across the bridge, and buried him along the stone wall. His body has never been recovered. He is still there. One of the reasons why he went there was to locate Lieutenant Colonel William Holmes and bring him home. You're going to hear some of the results of him answering us, <coughs> telling us where he is buried. As a, the archaeologist that I am, I am getting permission from the National Park Service to use ground penetrating radar to go where he says he is and see if I can locate an anomaly. If there's an anomaly there that indicates that somebody might be there, we're going to dig it up, excavate it. And if we can find remains of a lieutenant colonel from the Confederacy, we're going to do what we should do, bring him back home to Georgia. And that's what we'll be talking about a little bit later. That's what we do. This is not Ghost Hunting 101. Next one. I'm getting off. I'm, going, I'm becoming more uh, uh, improvised. I'm getting off of this. So, traces must in some way relate to social realities. Okay. This is a uh, painting of that battle at Burnside Bridge. You see all the smoke going on, so it's obscuring them, the men crossing the bridge, the Confederates here. So, the social reality is this happened here. What remains of this happened here? That's what we want to know. It's related, it has to be related to the social reality of that. There are no Roman centurions or demons on this battlefield directing these American Civil War soldiers into battle. Because that is not contextual. Even though they fought like demons, there are no demons there. That's very important. Next thing. So, whatever happened there, we have to prove that what remains is part of what happened there on September 17, 1862. We must be very, and we must be very careful in our field work. To investigate is to potentially inscribe. A non-contextual inscription can create an erasure of some fragment of past production. I'm going off the, off the paper. So, that means if we're a nice group of local ghost hunters who go ghost hunting with their black sunglasses and black clothes and going with all of their electronic equipment into the field and say, is anybody here with us tonight? Could you show us a sign of your presence? Could you light that torch for us? That's non-contextual. That is very damaging. What does it do? It creates another image, another impression another residual. It suppresses what was there historically. An indication of that is this photo. Now, what, let me give you the background to this photo. At the bridge entrance, it's not very wide, and you have these troops rushing toward the bridge, Union troops, in formation, 17 men abreast across. Those that made it to the bridge, they were all crunched up because it was very, very narrow. That's where many of the men died. 
there were descriptions of that bridge entrance where you had bodies laying down all over the place. You had so much blood that the second advance, the third advance, the fourth advance, and the fifth advance were falling over the bodies, were slipping on the blood. It was so bad. So, 12 o'clock midnight, we were there with everything controlled, nobody allowed in, in the little valley which this is located, with the National Park Service there in attendance, making sure nobody is in that area. We were between scenarios taking a rest, because when we do our scenarios, it's very, very tiring. So we were between scenarios, so I had one of the investigators take a photograph at that precise location where all these dead bodies were once there, where all this blood was there on the ground. He took a photograph. What did he get? A jogger in shorts. You see it? Now, why did he get a jogger in shorts? That's because that jogger habitually jogs in that area maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, for many, many years. That's what we got. That non-contextual behavior suppressed what was there in the past. Now, the question for me is, this is great. I can prove some of my ideas, but what's even more interesting is that jogger who is jogging there, is he alive or is he dead? Was that a residual of somebody jogging that was imprinted on the environment, or is that a person who is still alive who continues to jog there? That opens another door. We're going to go back and do another scenario with the jogger there and repeat it and see if we get the same thing. So I'm trying to determine whether this is a residual or this is this is a residual of a dead person or a residual of a live person. Again, there's a lot of different things you can do. So, any activity developed over historical time engenders, produces a space, and can only attain practical reality or concrete existence within that space. This happened here. This is that stone wall I was told I told you about. Somewhere along this stone wall, they buried Lieutenant Colonel William Holmes. We have the women in black with lanterns portray his relatives in the 1860 census going out by name saying, yes, this is your Aunt Tilly. Where are you? We're looking for you. We want to bring you home. And that's very, very important in the 19th century society. I'll talk about that. But they were there going along this stone wall back and forth on three different investigations with three different teams of women with three different RTEVP recorders. On all three times, same voice, same words, same location. Coincidence? I'm sure it wasn't some extraneous radio signal that's waiting for us to come there. Some radio station saying, like, oh, they're back, so let's talk like Colonel Holmes again, because we don't set up the times that we go there. It's kept everything, you know, controlled that we don't let people know when we're going and uh, what we're doing. Three separate times, same voice, same words, same location. But that third time, I have it marked off, we're going to go with the ground penetrating radar. If there's nothing there, that's fine. But if there is a possibility that there is something there, isn't it worth it? Next one. Oh, yeah, that's it. What were you getting here? This one would be Mike and... Okay. This is Mike. What happens now? Along the, the salt road where the first four salts came up, the 11th Connecticut, the first, the 28th May, uh, Massachusetts, I mean, the 28th Ohio, the 12th Massachusetts, all these Union troops going up this road toward the bridge. This is taken during that initial peripatetic walk. We're walking around, but we're recording audio all the time. This is what we got, live audio. Uncensored. That's us walking. That's us walking. Now you're going to start to hear something. Sounding. Here. The 
strap around? It's on me, no. There's something wrong with the strap. Look at it, it's broken. There's another tone of men shouting. The water's right And even if you have the headphones on, there's another tone. Turn off now. There's another tone of men shouting. There's another tone of men fighting, yelling. You can hear underneath his voice. And what he is saying, he's along this dirt road where the 11th Connecticut advanced, and he's saying somebody's messing with his canteen. And what happens is, He's looking at it, and his canteen turns completely around and starts to open up, and the water starts to come out. Very contextual. If you were in a Union advance trying to get to a specific location on the battlefield, you were rushed there. You were thirsty. You wanted water. In that brief, we, uh, we cut it down. It was like three minutes long. You could hear all kinds of stuff, but we cut it down because you don't have that much time. But the whole thing is like three or four minutes long. You could hear more men shouting, more men yelling. You could hear gunfire going off. And he's describing what's happening to his canteen. So in that one audio clip, you got a residual recurring men fighting in battle where they would fight. That's where they advanced. And you also got an interactive somebody messing with his canteen that we got recorded. <coughs> both the audio and the video. Again, I don't have time to show all this stuff. So you got, in that one take, you got interactive and residual. What's the next one? I don't remember. Oh, you will see what it is. Could anyone tell me what happened to Private John Thompson? Then this should happen. 
And we have another one, Alvin Flynn. If we did this, then this should happen. So personal biographies are formed through encounters with particular places in the cultural landscape and the recognition and understanding of the panoply of codes constituting their meaning. So we went out there saying, okay, we're going to create scenarios and a storyboard based on these cultural codes that were very important to soldiers and to mid 19th century society. Next one, Mary. Okay. First of all, we have to look at that battlefield again as a soundscape as memory. Past production of battlefield space. The battlefield space was produced by the sounds of what occurred there and not a landscape of memory. Going there and looking at, oh, here's the 11th Connecticut Monument. Here's where the 11th Connecticut fought. Well, that's contemporary. We don't want that. We're going to erase that. We're looking at the soundscape as memory. What did the soldier experience sonically in particular battlefield spaces? Let's replicate those sonic capabilities and see what happens. This is like creating morphogenetic fields, cultural fields, social fields, mental fields, a la Rupert Sheldon, if you know Sheldon's here. The excavation is based on a culturally constructed template, not the possibility of experiencing a paranormal event. Traces and fragments, if they remain as specific elements of a past soundscape, must attain particular contemporary significance what remains must indicate, uh, must verify the archaeological record of known past social reality of what happened on that battlefield on September 17, 1862. And this is what the battle, part of the battlefield looked three or four days after the battle. That's Burnside Bridge. This is where the 11th Connecticut came down from the field and ran up toward the bridge. This is that bottleneck where that, where that uh, jogger was found and where the most bloodiest part of the battlefield was. That's another view of Burnside Bridge. So I divided the battlefield into how it was divided during the American Civil War. It was divided into spaces called Kokoa, K-O-C-O-A. K stands for key areas. The key area here was the bridge. O stood for observation areas. Those are the areas, the Confederate positions on this side of the bridge, looking down on this. Cover and concealed areas were where the men, Union men assembled to begin the attack. Obstacle areas was this field and this bottleneck right there. It was an obstacle to get to the objective. And the last one, the A, was an avenue of approach how the Union soldiers approached the obstacle, I mean, the, the key area, which is going up that roadway. In each of those five different spaces, I created different scenarios of what would have occurred on September 17, 1862, of IMP behavior, inherent military probability. What the soldier would have done in that space and what he would have experienced. I create scenarios based on those. So I have a multitude of scenarios divided into five geographical locations and did scenarios relative to those geographical locations as militarily defined on September 17, 1862. Then I did scenarios that would not occur in those spaces, sort of like a null hypothesis. Every time I did that null hypothesis to do something that would not have occurred, not that. Didn't get anything. When I did scenarios that were contextual, we did get something. So I thought that was maybe significant. So I'm going to continue with that idea. Again, when I do an investigation, I might spend years, 20, 30 investigations at the same place because we get so many possibilities and so many avenues that open up as we're doing these scenarios. We just have to be going back, testing, retesting. And everything is written down. So everything is reiterative. We can repeat the same experiment 
time and again, even though it might be months apart, even though the investigators might be different, even though our audio equipment is different. We're retesting the same scenarios to make sure, oh, this happened here, what remains? This is what remains. We'll go back and do it again. Wow, same thing happened here. This is what happens. So I'm trying to eliminate as much as possible confirmation bias. I don't go in with expectations saying, oh, this is what happened here, so therefore we have to get this. I go in and say, okay, if this happens, then this should happen. If it doesn't, that's okay. I throw it out, try something else. Very important. But we document everything. That's enough. That's why I'm illuminating. You got this. All of that is theory and methodology to back up our conduct. There is no perception which is not full of memories. What, what we have to explain is not how perception arises, but how it is limited. Very important. So we've got to limit what occurred on that battlefield. You didn't experience five senses on that battlefield. You experience the auditory, the audio. Very important. So we've got to delimit what we can test. Um, these limited codes as a cultural template consist of three significant concepts, critical elements of mid-19th century society that affected soldiers in battle. These are. Now, right here is that photograph I told you about, and this is where Private John Thompson was initially buried. This is where, so we know exactly where it is in relationship to the bridge. This is where she walked with the lantern and searching. Can anybody tell me what happened to Private John Thompson? And right there, six second delay on that. Can anybody tell me what happened to John, Private John Thompson? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's what happened. Okay, so what's important is mid 19th century society is the good death. The good death meant that you died at home, surrounded by family, buried in a family pot with all the proper mourning rituals, all the women dressed in black for two years, etc., etc., etc. The Civil War changed that. Men did not die at home. They died far away from home. Many were never found. That's important. Second, domestic imagery. In mid-19th century American society, home was very, very important. Family was very, very important. Mother was very, very important. All of those elements are used in the scenarios because many times the boys never got to, get to go home, never experienced family again, and never saw their mother again. I use those in my scenarios. Third, band of brothers. Most of these soldiers came from the same locale. They were either friends or relatives. Everybody knew each other. That's why those soldiers were 17 across, marched, battle after battle, straight into line of fire. Because if they didn't, their friend here or their friend there, if they survived, will go back home and say, he was a coward. He ran away. Very, very important templates, very, very important images. All of those three things are used to develop these scenarios in specific battlefield spaces at a That's Again, I'm rushing this, but it's a lot more complicated. At Burnside Bridge, this is the hypothesis. At Burnside Bridge, those soldiers who did not receive the proper rights of the good death, that is, those who died on the battlefield, not those who died later in a field hospital, who remained, who remained lost and are forgotten by Colonel William Holmes, or were deprived of family mourning, and were not accorded similar rights by fellow soldiers, the band of brothers, who they saw he was wounded. So would you like to say you need to tell your mother something? Would you like to write something home? Those were not accorded any of them. I believe that some of these soldiers <coughs> may remain as interactive presences on the battlefield. They remain waiting to go home. That's my theory. That's what I test at Burnside Bridge. That's the what. Why are they there? That's what. So, this idea with the audio, tactic knowledge that people have about the structure of environmental sound, knowledge that manifests itself in behavior, that interprets such sounds and acts upon them. That's why I'm using the, the importance of sound, because it creates images, it creates memories. 
Sounds in the original context are stored in memory as patterns. And the sound, if heard again, usually brings the entire complex back to life. A particular pattern of sound always produces the same response. If there are interactive soldiers there still remaining to go home, if I play a sound mark that is contextual to what they learned in drills, then according to this, they will respond to that in a way that a soldier in 1862 would have responded. And that's what I'm looking for. Again, if there is an afterlife conscious mind that remains on these battlefields, 150 years later, we can use acoustical cues we propose to unearth who remains. This must involve a number of factors. We must be recognized by these soldiers as one of them. Identity is very important. That's why we don't wear logos. That's why we don't go dressed around in black and saying dumb things like, is anybody here? You saying, is anybody here? You're an outsider. Why would anybody ask me that if I'm here or not? Of course I'm here. I'm one of you. Very important. They must recognize a particular sound mark. A particular, there were 15 drum calls and 57 drum beats and 57 bugle calls. Each one meant a different thing. I use these in context before I do a scenario. If I'm doing a roll call of the soldiers who died in the 11th Connecticut, I use the bugle call to assemble these men. If they're still there, they're going to recognize that. And if they're still there, they're going to respond. Then I do the roll call. And every time I do the roll call, I get one man responding. And now they're asking me questions. Captain, is that you, Captain? On another one, which we don't have here, in between the names, I had someone say, Are you Stedman? Are you Stedman? Wait a minute. Here's the 39 who died in the 11th Canadian. Who's Stedman? There is no Stedman. What's Stedman? What's going on here? So I go back and do some research. I find that a major Stedman of the 11th Connecticut replaced Colonel Kingsbury, who died during the first assault. So me doing the roll call, somebody thought I was Major Stedman. I did not know that. There is no way that I planted in my head and projected that image out there for somebody to catch on to and say, please say you made your student. I didn't know. Nobody else knew. I don't tell you, I tell like we sit down as a group, I say, is this an hour we're gonna do? Let's make sure everybody knows their roles, and I don't give them any much details. We'll just do the scenarios, I know what's going on, I know what to do. So there's no way. When somebody says, is that you, Stedman? There's no way that's confirmation bias in any respect. They must, they must recall the proper military behavior that is associated with a particular sound mark. If I'm doing a bugle call that alerts the men to come to assembly, and then I do a roll call, they must answer the roll call. That's all. Not do something else, say something else, push me around, say get out of here, or anything like that. They're going to say, Private Alvin Fleet. Hi. That's what they would say. They wouldn't say, here, present. Hi. That's how an 18 year old would say. That's who Alvin Fleet was 18 years old. You're going to hear that too. That is contextual. Okay. Well, go, Mary, go. What constitutes the recognition we call Mr. Five in terms of an individual flight? Well, a personal biography that survives not merely as energy that manifests in his budget. That thought must be intentional. They must intentionally want to communicate with us so they communicate the proper way. Behavior, it has to be part of the behavior of the soldier of the American Civil War. Cultural, it has to be cultural specific to what occurred on September 17, 1862. And social, it must be a means for them to survive on the battlefield so they answer the roll call or they answer my commands I give them. If it doesn't, then it doesn't count. Okay, cut it. That's just a short clip. This is Mary reading a letter. Uh, a surgeon wrote writing a letter home to his wife, and she's reading a letter on a Sunday soldier. 
excuse me, that's not all of it, just a little, little bit of it. He starts singing. What's he singing about? Did you hear the word home? He, he says home. He's singing about home. And three seconds after he means, I don't know, and the uh, home, after he says home, three seconds later, she's reading the word home in the letter. Somebody's over her, he's over her shoulder reading the letter. So. <coughs> You'll hear one word. Traitor. When, when he says traitor, what I was doing is I just did the union roll call. Then I got a Confederate rebel yell and go, 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 went along that union advance where the union charged and went back. Somebody said to me, traitor. Well, this union soldier doing the roll call, then doing a rebel yell. I'm the traitor. Next one. Alvin Blake Jr. Get hard there, piece of the pile. Albert Blake Jr. All right. This is an 18 year old boy who died. <coughs> Very young. Okay, we'll go there on that. This stuff has to lift off all the. These sounds have to lift off the contemporary sounds, and that in the soundscape, they must be specific sounds that are contextual to a specific time period. The voices or instruments or both must be in synchrony while out of phase. They must be. Indigenous to that time period, but different than the sound that you would hear today. And they must be isochronous, they must be simultaneously to our contextual uh, specific sound mark performances. They must be 3D, distinctive, distinguishable, distinctively different. Don't mind, don't. <laughs> <laughs> if the sales are satisfied by those we perform an abduction, the lost people see the forms in their mouth and they think they have detected a meaningful prior and act upon that supposition. Once we hear somebody react to that, we follow it immediately up. We don't give ourselves high fives. Okay, investigation's over. We'll go home now. Go, go. That is Alvin. Okay, that's it. That is Alvin Frank, who said, I found an 18-year-old boy. That's it. 